Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for tuning in. Today we'll have our typical situational update from Commissioner Morrison and a FEMA report from FCO Will Roy. We'll also hear from Commissioner Goldstein about the $20 million business relief grant program we announced last week. They'll share, share details so businesses know how to apply and work to answer your many questions. But I want to be clear, right up front, $20 million will not be enough. It won't even come close to meet the total need or even reach all impacted businesses. In short, this isn't a perfect or complete solution to the challenges employers face. But we know it's important to do what we can as soon as possible. So Secretary Clouser, Mr. Goldstein, and their teams went to work and were able to free up this $20 million. We also worked to balance the need to get money out quickly with our goals to use this emergency funding to get people back to work and the doors of businesses back open, because that's the goal. This funding is meant as a lifeline. And coupled with supplemental funding are from our congressional delegation that they're working on, along with SBA loans and fundraising efforts, can help our businesses survive and recover. But to reiterate, in order to make sure we fully recover, we will need supplemental support from Congress to fill gaps for both businesses and individuals, as well as, well as long-term mitigation measures. Together, we can make sure the businesses that fuel our economy, create jobs, and make our communities vibrant and strong make it through this disaster. Finally, before I turn it over to Commissioner Morrison, I want to express my sincere congratulations to now Brigadier General Tracy Poirier, who was promoted from Colonel yesterday. General Poirier is the first woman in Vermont Army National Guard history to achieve the rank of Brigadier General. So we're very, very proud of you. And on behalf of all Vermonters, again, congratulations. Thank you for your service. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Morrison. Thank you, Governor. I have some handouts that I hope you'll share. Knowing that you guys are out in some of the hardest hit communities trying to get stories on the back roads and places like that, perhaps you can help us spread the word. I just have a few remarks today about weather, debris, and 211. We're cautiously watching today's weather and into this evening. We're monitoring conditions that could result in strong thunderstorms, lightning, winds up to 60 miles an hour, and localized flash flooding. Please keep an eye out for changing weather conditions and do not take chances. Getting buildings clean and dry remains a high priority. Communities are using a variety of strategies to remove debris from the right of way. Amongst those potential strategies are what three communities are doing, which is accessing the state debris contract. Montpelier Barry and Berlin are currently using the state contract. We expect more communities to access this state contract going forward. To date, there have been 1,342 tons of debris removed through this contract. If a municipality is struggling with flood debris removal, please elevate that concern to your local emergency management director. Your EMD can contact the State Emergency Operations Center for assistance. As of last night, 211 has received 4,290 calls related to the flooding. Some of those are repeat, but this is the overall number. More than one third of these calls have been from Washington County, which accounts for 1,596 of those calls. Windsor County has accounted for nearly 12% of 211 reports. And Lamoille County has accounted for just over 9% of the reports, yet it has the highest percentage of homes that were self-reported as uninhabitable. Of the 392 reports we have received from Lamoille County, 181 callers reported that their home was uninhabitable. 
763 callers statewide have self-reported that their home is uninhabitable, which is approximately 18% of the total number of reports that we've received. We continue to encourage Vermonters to report their damage to vermont211.org or by calling 211 if you are unable to get online. Every bit of the storm damage, whether it's a car, driveway, a wet basement that you pumped out yourself already, lost possessions, a blown culvert, anything that was damaged due to the floodwaters should be reported so that we can paint an accurate picture of the total damage in Vermont. We have handouts that you can take with you when you're in the community and encourage others to report their damage. There is no backlog of calls in the 211 system, so please go online or call today. That is all I have for you today. I thank you, and I will turn it over to General Roy. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning. On the 14th of July, the President issued a major disaster declaration for Vermont, and it's been amended six times. The dec declaration authorizes funding for hazard mitigation statewide to assist Vermont in preparing its infrastructure for future storms. The declaration authorizes funding for 14 county for emergency protective measures for activities associated with life-saving and life-sustaining operations. The declaration authorizes 11 counties for public assistance to assist the communities in recovering from the damage to the infrastructure like roads, bridges, culverts, and buildings. Nine counties as of today, with the addition of Orleans yesterday, have been declared for individual assistance for residents who have had damages directly tied to the storm. First, if you live in a declared county and you've had damages, first call 211 and then contact FEMA at 1-800-621-3362. 1-800-621-3362. FEMA, or you can go to disasterassistance.gov. Second, if you've already received the funding from FEMA and life circumstances have changed, like you've had to leave your home because of mold, contact FEMA. You may be eligible for additional assistance. Third, if you have been determined as ineligible either in part or whole for financial assistance from FEMA, please contact us at 1-800-621-3362 or go and visit us at one of our four disaster recovery centers. We have disaster recovery centers now in Waterbury at the Armory, in Barrie at the Auditorium, at 88 Merchant Row in Rutland, and at the Floodbrook School in Londonderry. Lastly, FEMA is here for the long term. We've already deployed personnel to Vermont to assist the state in its long-term recovery operations. I'll do a quick rundown of our operations uh, as of today. We currently have 476 personnel from FEMA in Vermont. Our disaster survivor assistance teams have visited 6,800 homes and 350 businesses, and they are in 17 communities today. We have five of our FEMA uh, mobile registration intake centers throughout the state for people to go there to sign up for assistance. We're also supporting the state's multi-agency resource centers. And as discussed earlier, we have four of our disaster recovery centers where people can go to sign up or seek assistance with FEMA. The Small Business Administration is also there and importantly, there are mitigation personnel to help you take a look at how you may be able to mitigate your home from future disasters. We have approved, we have approved $5.6 million in assistance for uh, individuals, of which $5 million has already been dispersed and in is people's bank accounts. We have visited, uh, correction, we have 2,100 homes requested to be inspected for damage, and we've already inspected 1,400 of those homes. So again, FEMA is here for the long term, and we look forward to working with the governor, his staff, 
to help Vermont become stronger after the storm than it was before. Thank you. Now will be followed by Commissioner Goldstein. Thanks. Good morning. As the Governor <coughs> mentioned and Secretary Curley mentioned last week, the Department of Economic Development has been hard at work to stand up a business emergency grant program for those impacted by the floods. The Business Emergency Gap Assistance Program is being established to provide rapid grant funding as rapidly as possible to assist businesses and not-for-profit entities that sustain physical damage so that they can get reopened and employees back to work again. We know that the $20 million will not be enough to meet the need that exists in the business community and gaps will remain, but this is just the beginning. At this time, the way we're going to calculate awards, um, applicants will, will send to us uh, their list of documented damages. So um, let's say they have $100,000 worth of damage. The award calculation will be 20% of the net documented damage to their physical property. And, and that property includes things like inventory, equipment, uh, supplies. The maximum level that they can get is $20,000. We put a ceiling on it so that we can get as many businesses that were impacted as possible, get them some funds. There will be opportunities to exceed that ceiling in cases where the physical damage was so significant, upwards of over a million dollars, that we will raise the cap from $100,000 to $250,000 to $500,000, to to depending on the level of employees that have been um, you know, at that organization that have been laid off. Of the $20 million, we will set aside a million dollars for agriculture, and the Agency of Agriculture will be working on developing a program specifically for farms. The physical losses, as I said, include physical space replacements. We're going to need things like if they have insurance estimates or estimates for replacement or estimates for repair. The businesses, uh, as ha we've been hearing about, have been collecting photographs, damage assessments, all these estimates, and we will need to collect that. They will upload that to the system. The net physical loss, just to be clear on the calculation, is the remaining loss after they enter in what is expected from possible insurance and what is expected from other possible grant programs that they may have applied to or received money from. And we take the 20% from that net physical loss. This is a high level uh, recap of the program. We're going to release the details over to our website so that folks could get prepared. We expect to open this portal next week. Uh, we are putting finishing touches on. We've only started working on this in a week. And the good people of the Agency of D Digital Services have been acting very rapidly to get us a solution. Um, we hope, we really hope that this will truly bridge a gap for business owners. Once again, we can't say enough. We understand this will not make businesses whole, but we really want to bring state resources to an already very robust effort by charitable organizations all over the state that have been raising funds for uh, grant programs. Uh, we believe this is the first of many steps. As the governor mentioned, we will need to collect information from all impacted folks not just physical. We will collect information about economic injury, even though we can't pay on that at the moment. But we need the most aggregated level of uh, damage assessment so that we could um, try to get additional federal resources. Um, the other thing I want to encourage and the other message I really want to get out there is the SBA resources have timelines and deadlines. And we really hope that businesses don't wait to apply for that, even though those are loans. We really don't want anybody to miss an opportunity. They could always turn down a loan commitment. They don't have to accept it. But what's important is that they get uh, the capability to tap into resources that exist while they're waiting for, let's say, this grant program, which, again, we know is only going to pay a fraction of, of the harm. The key really is just that this is the first of many steps. We really we know it's not perfect, and it doesn't come anywhere near addressing all of the gaps. We know this, but it is a start, and we're moving forward. And we want to help as much as we can. And uh, we will have more information out on our website, and hopefully a portal open next week. Thank you.
We'll now open up to questions. Commissioner, I wanted to be clear on something. Let's say we've got a business that has a GoFund account or their customers have contributed to them. Does that get deducted from that $100,000 number? Yes, the way we need to work it as a way to prevent duplication of benefit is to make sure that we're paying on net physical damage. So if they've already received some sort of funding to help restore or repair or get them back, we can't pay on that same use of funds. So our only way to do that is to ask for all their other sources and then pay a percentage of the net, and sort of net of, uncovered, if you will. A lot of these businesses uh, don't own their buildings. So how does that work for them? Understood. Um, so we are asking questions, you know, do they own or do they lease? Some business tenants will be responsible for leasehold improvements, some perhaps not. So it's going to depend on what the actual repair needs to be. But the, this program will be open for landlords. So we understand their role in being able to get their premises back to working order so businesses could reopen. But for businesses that are tenants, most likely they're going to need inventory, they're going to need equipment, supplies. Most of their things may have been washed out. So we are going to accommodate that. And best case scenario, how soon would the money be out the door? I would say a couple of weeks. If we launch next week, probably somewhere between seven and ten days thereafter, we could start with disbursements. But um, I'd feel a lot better after I actually see the full application online. You say it's going to be open to landlords, so does that include residential yes, landlords? Yes, it does. It, and is there going to be any sort of like um, proportion of money to go toward like traditional businesses, for lack of a better word, versus landlords? Like you mentioned, we have not done. Yeah, we have not done that actually. Okay. Yeah, just a general pool. I have one more question too. I'm sorry I walked in a few minutes late and you guys might have covered this. Um, you had talked about the need for some federal funding to bolster these, this business assistance. Can you tell me anything more that you know about that? No, just that we're working with our congressional delegation and they're working hard in Washington uh, to make the case uh, for more funding. And that's why it's so critical with 211. We've talked about that a lot. Even if you're your county has qualified, met the threshold. We need you to continue to report to 211 your damages. Um, and if you reported damages and you've incurred more damages since, report those damages because we need, they need all that information to make the case in Congress for supplemental funding. So um, they're doing all they can at this point. Um, they're making, uh, hopefully, inroads, uh, but, uh, but it's going to be uh, challenging for them as well. Is there a precedent for Congress to give a state money for business grants? Obviously, there's clearly precedent. For I, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Uh, probably a better question for some of them that have been there a while. I mean, Congress is about to go on its August recess. So Good time for them to make that allocation before they go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is there a backup plan? Well, again, we're doing all we can with the existing resources, limited resources we have uh, in our state coffers. Um, push comes to shove, we'll, we'll, I mean, we're always looking under every rock, uh, pulling every lever uh, to find more resources. So uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Uh, but, uh, but we're putting a lot of stock in our congressional delegation. Uh, obviously, they're influential uh, in D.C., and uh, hopefully they can make the case. Because as I said the other day, um, you know, this isn't uh, a red state problem or a blue state problem. This is a, a state issue that we all face. Governor, this morning, uh, Montpelier Alive's director told Montpelier, told the legislature that Montpelier businesses are hesitant to take on SBA debt because they're still under a lot of COVID era debt. Is there anything the state can do in terms of uh, interest forgiveness, extensions, something like that to help that problem? Um, well, I don't think they have. Um, we didn't give them loans. Um, these are SBA loans and, and so forth. That, again, a congressional probably level question. The, the treasurer says that the state has some $2.4 billion cash on hand Money that's, that's been allocated. That's allocated, by but, the way. But it hasn't gone out the door. Right. Is, you, you talk about pulling levers. Could potentially that? Yeah, I mean, again, that's very, very short term. Um, when you think about that, we've committed all of that money, and probably then some. 
so it's um, it's out the door, um, and or it's going to be going out the door uh, in the not too distant future. So uh, it could be a short term solution, but not a long term solution. And then what? Commissioner Goldstein, um, the one million dollars that you said was specifically for ag. Uh, does that count the cannabis industry as well? Yes, that yes. would count the cannabis. And also, um, the cannabis growers, the cannabis retail shops would be available under the 19, the remaining okay. 19 million. They're a retail operation. Okay, okay. And then, in, I'm sure this is a really complicated formula you guys have come up with to allocate this money. Is there any kind of weight that will... Um, Prioritize money for small businesses or new businesses or BIPOC businesses? The, um, the formula is 20% uh, of net physical damages, so it wouldn't matter how old the business is, as an example. What would matter is if the larger amount of damage. So for the higher level of damage, that's why we have the ability to surpass the 20,000. For BIPOC owners, we are partners with Vermont Professionals of Color Network. They are going to be outreach coordinators as well as technical assistance providers to make sure that constituency knows exactly about this grant and what it has to offer and what they need to gather in order to apply. I asked about the new businesses because I know I don't need to tell you that the first two years of starting a business is extremely testy already yes. and this could be well, I'm sure. If you're a new or small business. It'll be very, very tough for the very small and very new businesses. And that's why we're basing the formula not on revenue, but on the damage. So what is it going to cost for them to start back over again? And in some respects, um, when you think about the, the formula, it does help some of the, the smaller businesses because that cap of 20,000 means more, the 20,000 means more to them, a very small business than 20,000 to a much larger business. Mm -hmm. So it does help them, excuse it in a way. What can people in Orleans County, I, I, this is probably best for, for you, uh, what can people in Orleans County expect to see now, now that this designation has been made? Well, we, we already have our, our disaster survivor assistance teams in Orleans County. Uh, those who have already signed up for assistance, uh, they call uh, FEMA. It's unfortunate that the, the disaster assistance .gov only works if you're in a declared county, but you can call FEMA at 1-800-621-3362, and they'll walk you all the way through the process, but they'll suspend you um, and tell us the time as a county is declared. So in Orleans County, we had a number of individuals who had done that, and their, their assistance already starts uh, because it's been declared. For those who have not done that, they can either go to uh, FEMA uh, at, at the disaster assistance.gov, they can call the 1-800-621-3362, um, or they can uh, visit one of the disaster recovery centers that we'll be establishing. So what's different for them today, for these homeowners in particular, than it was yesterday? Is this your, your agency will now be doing more on-site inspections? It, so that's a great question, and thanks for trooping leading me to the answer. Um, so bottom line front, yesterday they weren't, they weren't eligible for financial assistance from FEMA. Today they are. Individual assistance. Individual assistance. Thank you, Governor. What kind of factors would go into somebody in any county being denied individual assistance? Great question. Um, so let's say you have insurance and you collect, uh, you inform FEMA uh, in your application that you have insurance, but you haven't filed uh, the determination on your insurance claim. Perfect example. So people should continue to apply even yes. to the yeah. process? So typically what will happen is, is they'll get a notification from FEMA that says you are ineligible for assistance. Please read this, uh, this letter carefully. And then I'll list exactly what it is in their application that causes them to not be eligible in part or in whole. Um, and so uh, they can be confusing. In fact, we met with uh, the congressional delegations to walk them through these type of letters and who to contact if a constituent reaches out to them. So what we say is if you get, get one of those letters, either call us or visit us at one of our disaster recovery centers and sit down with our applicant specialists and they can work you through that. They can upload documents for you. They can explain it better for you. 
uh, and assist you uh, in there. And if your status changes, as I mentioned, if all of a sudden you know you have to leave your residence, you may be additional may be able to get additional funding. Any idea how many people might be denied assistance at, least at this point because of this reason? Uh, I, 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 we have a, a graph which which we can share with you as to by type on what they've been denied. I will tell you that. Uh, for FEMA Region 1, based out of Boston, who are here uh, overseeing the individual assistance uh, with the field, they do a 100% call-out. Anybody that has applied for assistance from FEMA will get a call from, from our team. Do you, I guess the last one, do you know how many people received assistance during Irene? I don't know if you have that number. We do know that f over 4,000 people um, did receive assistance during Hurricane Irene, and that's kind of our, our benchmark for, for where we are. We also recognize, though, that this, as the governor had said, right, Irene was a 12-hour incident, very impactful. This has been a really long one. So the chances are there's more people impacted by this disaster than Irene. Do you think any of, so that's five counties that are not on the list? Yes, sir. Nine are. Do you think any of the remaining five are close to qualifying? I don't know. We continue to work with the state uh, on doing assessments, and that's why the 211 data is so important. It's absolutely critical for us to understand the damages, you know. And we also all recognize that Vermont are hardy people, right? If something happens, it's like oh, I'll fix it. I'll take care of myself, you know, and I'll, I'll you know, and I'll, I don't need to report it because I already took care of it. Well, please report it because it helps. It helps the state look at this in totality and may be able to qualify. That's what happened with Orleans, right? They, 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 we didn't have the data we needed. We really, really pushed 211, and we got enough information to be able to declare them. <laughs> Bless you, Does sir. the state know how many people may still be without phone or internet service? That I will have to turn over to Commissioner Tierney's office. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Tierney, are you on the line, and did you hear the question? Yes, Governor, I did, and no, I don't have that data right at hand, but we can get that. I think it's more likely at the Vermont Community Broadband Board. We will get an answer if I can get the name of the reporter. I can get that to you, June. Thanks. I believe earlier this week there was talk of getting a better understanding of damages to schools. Um, do you have any updated numbers, and are there any districts that you worry might not be able to go back in person uh, due to damage. Yeah, Secretary Boucher, are you online? Yes, uh, thank you, Governor. So our updated totals are uh, 10 schools that have now reported major damage, 14 schools that have reported minor damage, and 95 that have reported no damage. Um, at this point, uh, we're pretty confident at the AOE that all public schools will open on time, uh, not carrying of any major concerns in that space. And there are still a couple of independent schools that we're working on um, to figure out their timelines and, and whether they can open on time. I have a question for Secretary Davis. I'm wondering, there's like uh, ancillary, ancillary problems for farms that weren't affected by the flooding but are going to face supply. Uh, problems, I think, I know that like a lot of people haven't been able to cut their hay. Or yeah, like feed that. and so forth. So yeah. I'm wondering how it's going to affect the farms that weren't actually flooded. Uh, good morning. Anson Tebbets with the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. I think one pocket that we're monitoring closely is uh, supply and quality of feed for livestock. Um, you're correct that, um, you know, most farmers are able to get maybe one crop off the field if it's hay. Uh, second one, some people would this week had two or three days and they're starting to get that crop in. So I think the availability uh, will be a concern. It's something we're monitoring. We're working uh, behind the scenes to work on, uh, you know, availability, whether it be uh, corn that was lost, that was underwater, whether it be uh, standing hay that was underwater, or just the quality uh, of it also, I think, is at risk as well. On a similar note, are you hearing from farmers that are having trouble getting their equipment repaired? Um, there are some cases where, uh, yes, um, I talked with a, a farmer in Johnson, and he had a, a number of tractors that were underwater, uh, really important tractors for his produce farm. And he's, he's worried that, you know, one day they may, they may start, and then two weeks down the way, you know, with electrical problems, they're going to be a problem. So he was really concerned about 
that aspect of his infrastructure at risk. Um, and he's a mechanic, so he was um, his side job was being a mechanic. He was really concerned about um, some of that infrastructure that he lost that was underwater. What about getting m mechanics to farms to repair equipment or um, um, moving the equipment to like, like a John Deere mechanic? I think. Um, when I talked with him, um, he was going to do his best. He's got a good network of people that he has uh, that he was relying on to help him with that. Um, but I did ask him, like, do we need to do we need to work on getting you some help with that? And he was confident that his network of people that um, he's been working with over the years and his own experience, he'd be okay. Where do we stand with the National Guard? <clears throat> What's their main posture, and, and what, what have they been up to now that we're in week three? General? <laughs> um, hi, I'm General, Brigadier General Tracy Poirier. I'm the Director of the Joint Staff for the Vermont National Guard. Um, so we are starting to stand down some of our troops. Currently, we have 57 um, airmen and soldiers that are solely focused on flood response and recovery missions. And I, I put that caveat on that number because we have a lot of full-time employees that are doing this as well as their full-time job. So there's a lot more people applied to the issue, um, but those are the people that are solely doing that mission for us. Um, our distribution team is still on, so they're kind of on standby to be able to move things around the state. The LNO team is um, working on recovering their vehicles, and they're kind of standing down. That communication has become very solid between the towns and this. LNO. Oh, sorry, liaison teams. LNO, liaison officers. Um, so that communication has become very solid between the emergency center and the towns, so they don't really need us there to kind of make those connections. The, um, the more recent team was what we were called the uh, point of distribution, the pod teams, that they were um, supplying PPE, and we had them in five, six, five locations around the state. Um, but we are standing, they didn't, weren't getting a lot of used people coming to them, so we've changed the mode, and we will now be pushing that PPE out to states. So states, I think, are reaching into the emergency management center and saying, I really kind of need this many gloves and this much masks, and we're just kind of going to push out to them rather than having people sitting lonely in their pod um, locations. Uh, and then we also have just the extra folks that are covering down in the emergency operations center, and they'll stay on as long as the emergency operations center is there. That's basically what we're doing right now. General, uh, so the couple Marines rescued some rescued a woman right outside of the uh, firing range. So what, what does an Army general have to say about the Marine Corps now? <laughs> um, I was actually a Marine for eight years before I moved to the Army, so I'm all for it. Uh, yeah, they, uh, we actually, uh, I think the um, adjutant general gave those two Marines a couple coins for their service. Is Commissioner Morrison still here? No, but Deputy Commissioner, if you. Those numbers that the Commissioner cited at the the top of the presser about um, damage to homes and um, do you know if that was based off of 211 data or FEMA data? Right now it's primarily 211 data. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Did you have those? At, also, I, I didn't write them down. I'll be happy to share them with you. I'm going to go to the phones next and we'll start with uh, Keith Rutland Herald. I'm all set for now. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Joseph, The Chronicle. All right, we'll try Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Commissioner Goldstein. I'm wondering about, there could be many, many funding sources that come in when you're looking at the net. Um, I'm kind of wondering about the, the timing. This, this happened with um, uh, the pandemic as well. Uh, money sources could be coming in and a, a business could find that it, it actually has, at the end of the day, more money coming in. Will there be an effort to try and claw that back? How do you, how do you, how do you anticipate um, uh, this process working fairly for everyone so someone is not, at the end of the day, getting a lot more than someone else? Yeah, understood. Thanks, Tim. That's a great question. We're doing our best efforts to have folks enter those 
amounts in, and obviously we cannot control if somebody else starts up a charitable fund, you know, three months from here. But we could only do what we can control. During the process, the applicant will attest that they, if they are found to have gotten more money than what their damages are, they need to return it. Um, so there are some attestations. We really do depend on um, their ability to be honest, but we are doing our best efforts to collect whatever information is readily available right here, right now. Yeah, the, I, I was thinking that you know, people might not be dishonest, but they might find at the end of the day that, yeah. that you know they got, got more. So that's, that's fair enough. Thank you. Uh, again, Tim, just to reiterate with the 20%, uh, and the $20,000 cap, um, I, don't, I don't think there's too much of a danger at this point in our over allocation. So um, that's one of the benefits of, you know, going in slowly and uh, not, not by choice, but the way we're doing it. Uh, and then we'll be able to assess the need as time goes on. All right. Thank you very much, Governor. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. No questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom. Back to the room. Can I just ask, we've been warned a lot about um, fraud and scammers. Have we actually seen any signs of that happening? I'm sure there are signs. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to weigh in on that, but I haven't heard any of anything specific at this point. Maybe. I know there were, we had, um, we had reports from Central Vermont that some people were posing as FEMA, working for FEMA, but they hadn't. But I don't have data points on how much. But it was soon thereafter that you started making announcements about identification. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And uh, the, uh, the only case we, we know of where it was uh, put forward, it was actually one of our disaster survivor assistance people helping somebody sign up. Uh, they, were, they had a business and they were individual. And, if you want to receive an electronic uh, funds transfer, you obviously have to offer up your bank account information to us. Um, and so they have to input that. So I think there was a little confusion on that. Um, other than that, we have not yet seen, not yet seen a fraud, but we always tell people, you know, we identify who we are. We have, uh, you know, we have our badges. Uh, they, can, uh, uh, they can certify that, that, you know, we are in fact with FEMA. Uh, if you don't have that, you know, don't share your, your critical information. Thank you. Just sir. Just to clarify, so you said there was, like, somebody going around claiming to be a FEMA agent nope. asking for bank? Actually, the other way around, it was actually a FEMA uh, person uh, who met with an individual, and they owned a business, and they also were filing as an individual. And so they helped him as an individual. Somehow it got mistaken. Um, so, uh, but it allowed us to jump in early to talk about, hey, be careful of scams, because unfortunately there are people out there that will take advantage of people who have been, uh, uh, you know, in, in very troubled times like this. So there have not been reports of I have, We have seen none yet so far. Okay. okay. It, does FEMA have, like, um, it, are you able to share what a real badge looks like, like an example of it, so people know what to look for? Um, because it's a, a Department of Homeland Security badge, it's not something we can take a picture of and, and push out. Um, but they have the FEMA vest. They actually have, like I do, my, my ID card where they can show, uh, show them. So um, that's, that's the start point. And of course, going to disasterassistance.gov, right, is a secure site. And calling 1-800-621-3321 uh, is, a, is a secure site. Okay. Just yes, sir. Um, two, two things. Uh, trust but verify. I think that's what the general is talking about. Um, but also, uh, if there are any concerns uh, about fraudulent activity, uh, call the Attorney General's office, uh, and they have someone there working on that. That's what I, I wanted to say. Is we have had, uh, separate from FEMA, we have had some business owners um, who have expressed concern about what they're being uh, sold. It happened very early on where, where there were people coming in saying, we'll clean for either extremely high amounts or if you give me a 10% deposit, I'll book it for whenever and it'll be reimbursed by FEMA. Now keep in mind, it probably never made it to FEMA because hopefully those business owners never entered into that because they, they can't be promising 
what FEMA or somebody else's insurance company will be paying back. So we've just been saying to business owners, like, you know, trust your instincts. If it doesn't feel right, what was it you just said? The check. Trust and verify. Yeah, <laughs> trust and verify. Um, but again, uh, we uh, what the governor said is, you know, we want to make sure that those are reported um, because we want to make sure others aren't. It, it's not going out br more broadly. Governor, could you? Sure. Three, three, six, two. I think I said three, three, six, one. Is three, three, six, two. My apologies. Commissioner Goldstein, I can't believe I forgot to ask this question. The $20 million grant program, is that first come, first serve, or is there going to be an application due date and then you'll weigh all the actions? It's first come, first serve because we're understanding that there's an urgency here, and rather than waiting everybody to wait for a period of time, we want to tend to it right away. Got Thanks. Got I just have one more question, and that's about the home buyout program. As somebody here said, it's sort of becoming apparent now where it might not have been a week ago that some homes aren't going to be livable. Um, can you tell me anything more about that? Yeah, I, I, here's what I know about the home buyout program. It takes a long time. Uh, it's not instantaneous. Um, we went through it with Irene. Uh, there was some that went through years um, before they were able to to attain the buyout. Um, and I'll let uh, uh, um, Will talk about this maybe a little bit more. Uh, th this is the other uh, piece of this that we're hoping uh, the congressional delegation will be able to have some funding available for that as well, uh, over and above what is uh, uh, able to obtain through FEMA. because. We're just going to have to think about this a little bit differently in the future and what areas we should be uh, building in and what areas uh, that have been built in that shouldn't have been. Uh, so it's going to take uh, uh, resources and dollars in order to, to make those determinations for the future. So we're going to need that in whatever supplemental bill uh, that they are able to, uh, to attain. Would that apply uh, to something like uh, the mobile home parks? I'm thinking the one mm -hmm. in Berlin that I yeah, think River was, Run that was declared or what, uh, Westons. Yes, yeah. was declared a, a disaster area or it not inhabitable. It, yeah. So would, it, would the state be saying that's just not a good place to build another park in the future? Yeah, it, you know, unfortunately, we have a housing crisis on our hands. You might have heard about it. Um, so it's it's difficult at this point in time to condemn a piece of property that has lots available, but in time we might want to take a look at something like that. Um, and River runs another one on the Barry Montpelier Road uh, that has been impacted multiple times. And so those are the types of situations that we have to take a look at and determine whether it's appropriate uh, to, to do this long term and what, what the answer is. So it's going to take resources because they still need a place to live. So we're, we're going to have to, to do this in a, a strategic way uh, in order to, for everyone to, to have someplace safe to live in. So for folks that are displaced, how does the state's own emergency motel program factor into it? Because FEMA also has money for hotel motel states. Yeah, well, again, there's the GA program that we have, uh, and uh, Secretary Samuelson is probably on the line, can describe some of that. Uh, but if you're displaced uh, from your home uh, due to the flooding, uh, then there is FEMA reimbursement. Will, do you want to sir, add anything that I might have talked about with yes, the sir. buyouts as well? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so FEMA provides the funding to the communities who are actually the agents that, that do the buyout. Uh, so it's, it's a local, you know, it's, it's always executed best at the local level, right? So, so FEMA works uh, with the state uh, to provide the funding for the communities to execute that. And then it's the locals who work uh, on those. Um, with regards to you know displaced population, um, FEMA does have housing options right now. If you've been, um, we have uh, over I think it's 451 people who are receiving rental assistance uh, due to being uh, uh, damages from from their property. Um, now that doesn't mean necessarily that all those people are somewhere else. Um, it's one of the things where you can receive rental assistance if you anticipate moving, but you may not have. Um, it's really the second month when they request f uh, f federal assistance for rental assistance that we'll get a better picture of that. Um, um, and then 
you know, uh, so we do, there are a couple programs we do uh, provide reimbursement for people who have been displaced as part of their application process, and they continue to, to update us on their status so we can reimburse them for, for their expenditures. When you say rental assistance, is that for hotels or yes. for apartments? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So should people displaced because of the flood go through FEMA and not the state GA program? Well, I can tell you if, they, if they've had damages that make them eligible for, uh, to go somewhere else, they ought to utilize the program that's in place. Um, with regards to state, you know, if it's a long-term program, you know, obviously they'll have to take a look at what the state has available. You also mentioned there were some 1,400-ish um, homes that have been inspected so far. Do we know how many of those are uninhabitable because of damage or mold or anything else? So the, uh, the entry into assistance from FEMA is is an inspector looking at your home or your apartment to determine the damages they've had. And so there's been over 2,100 people who have asked for us uh, to come and inspect their property for damages, again, with the home or their apartment. Um, and that's the entry into the program, and then based upon that, we determine eligibility. Um, as far as the, the, the damages is concerned, um, it, it, that's really not a feedback um, mechanism that we have with the state. I, c I can tell you um, that there, there have been a number of structures have been red tagged, uh, meaning mobile homes and, and homes and so forth. We learned this morning uh, 60 to 70 thus far. Statewide, statewide 60 to 70 homes so far. are probably uninhabitable. Right. Or are uninhabitable. Yeah, and that's just a preliminary number. Are they concentrated in any one area? Well, again, Washington County uh, seems to have suffered the most damage and the most displacement, so in and around the area. Okay. Uh, that uh, Weston's Trailer Park uh, in, uh, or Mobile Home Park in Berlin uh, is one where a number of homes have been red tagged. Are we any closer to getting just a rough estimate of what the economic damage uh, has been to the state? No. I'm sure we're getting closer, but we're not there yet. Um, my colleague Lola talked to, it was the Emergency Operations Center yesterday. I'm admittedly not an expert since it's her conversation, not mine. And they said that 314 people have reported needing shelter. Um, is that people in like for, like Red Cross shelters, or does that also count people in hotels? I would or? imagine it, it, it accounts for everyone. Um, but, Dan? I don't have the exact number off my fingertips. I'm, I'm happy to follow up with you. Um, we have deployed a number of shelter situations, uh, most of which have been the Red Cross. There have, especially early on, uh, I think there were three local shelters that were deployed by municipalities or regions. And then how about people like staying with friends and family? I imagine that's really hard to track. It's very hard to track. Okay. Uh, and we just, and that's exactly the right way to say it. We, we just don't know the total number that we, we certainly hear about them and we are managing some of them. Uh, but at the same time, uh, more often than not, we just don't cross the radar with those. Back on the note of schools, if I could just ask the secretary a follow-up about um, schools think that they can open on time, but are there concerns about mold in them and what's being done to mitigate them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we have not heard anything specific coming through, so we're having ongoing conversations with all the affected schools um, almost a daily um, basis. We will have, um, I think by the end of this week, we will have a more substantive support, uh, report that will have um, a summary of all of the um, more detailed information that we've been collecting this week, and we're happy to share that with you. But at this point, um, we have not heard of mold contamination as a, a central theme um, for you know the majority or a number of schools yet. Yeah, for instance, I saw uh, Montpelier High School, they have a professional 
um, service in there, and, and they have a lot of dehumidifiers and fans and so forth drying the place out, so I'm sure that they're adept to, to removing the potential for mold. mold. Thank you all very much. See you next week.